Most of the stories we hear is about Saudi Arabia. How, how is it like in the rest of the Middle East? It's worse in, for example, Iraq. It's worse. Are there Kenyans there? Yes. Doing the same thing? A, f a few of the, like, there's one case I handled and that was offered. Okay. She died. Like Diana said, when she got there, she was told, you will remain here, I've bought you. I can quote her. She said, I bought, uh, I mean, she quoted the words and said, yeah. I, I bought you. So you will stay here until the contract ends. But Zaina, that sounds like modern day slavery. Exactly. Did you listen to the hot breakfast this morning? Here's what you missed. The grass is greener on the other side. And right? it usually looks greener sometimes. From from here mm -hmm. until you get there. You saw the story of Diana Chepke Moy the other day. She had gone to Saudi Arabia looking vibrant, looking fantastic, going there just to make a little money to pay fees. Mm. And then a few week, months later, you saw her on social media and she looked like a wreck. A total wreck. Like the picture on the left with the dreadlocks, with the nice glowing skin. She looks like someone you want to hang out with every day. Yeah. The other side, like, wow, needs to be in hospital for a few months, maybe, you know. Yeah, thank goodness uh, Diana was able to come back home. I think she arrived yesterday. Yes. And to be reunited with her family. But some do not even make it that far. And some come back in body bags. Mm -hmm. It is not a pleasant experience for many, although... The Minister of Labor told us not too long ago that there are about 97,000 Kenyans in Saudi Arabia alone. And each and every week, uh, some manage to share their stories on social media, the ones who've got their phones and have an avenue to express themselves. But at the same time, there are many who come back and their stories are unheard of. Mm, or oh, horror stories. Yes. Horror stories. Here to tell us more and explain to us why is it that people still keep going despite the stories we here despite the people who come back with horror stories zaina combo is a campaigner uh inequalities and discrimination at amnesty international kenya joins us live in the studio zaina welcome to hot 96 thank you Jeff. Thank you. good morning good morning these stories i mean we keep hearing horror story after horror story after horror story zaina and i know you have experienced this firsthand. What is it that keeps um, people going? Is it desperation? Is that what it is? Exactly. Desperation and whatever is happening is a clear manifestation of the man it man society. Mm. Because despite the knowledge, despite the experiences, we still take our people. We still have rogue agencies in existence despite having the National Employment Authority, despite having the Ministry of Labor, despite having the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, those three institutions should take charge. Tell us about these rogue agencies, because for years, since I was a child, there's been people going to Saudi Arabia, but you know, not most all these stories to get to the paper or to TV, but now we have social media, but these rogue agencies, let's start there. How do they operate? Are they legally registered? Are they supposed to be, uh, you know, guided by some laws and regulations? And how much does one pay? Mm. Do we know? Um, so it depends with the agent. But again, so the thing is, the National Employment Authority is the one mandated to register any agent that then wants to take people to Saudi or rather export labor for that matter. But what happens is still there are quite a number of agencies that are not registered but still operate. And the question is what is the National Employment Authority doing? Bottom line uh, from experiences from families who've sought support, there's a lot of corruption going on. Because when you go to an agent and some families have recorded the conversations, they're despicable. I cannot even mention some of the words that are used. And there's a lot of impunity. They say, Utani fanya nini? Fanya vila unataka? Where will you go? Where will you take me? Yet, we have a National Employment Authority that is mandated to ensure that these rogue agencies are brought to book. But that doesn't happen. Despite the efforts of civil society organizations that have 
spoken out loud together with families saying that our people are suffering, calling out for another ban. But still, this happens in broad daylight. So um, some people have tried to go to the agencies seeking information, but the moment they realize you, you just want to sort of investigate them. Of course, they don't give you information. Mm -hmm. And for those who've posed like desperate people who need uh, jobs abroad, you're, you're told also you will come, you, f you fill this form, you need to pay this amount, the, m the amount varies. From, from what? From, give, from agent. Okay, I, I think varying from 100,000 there about, depending, it depends. You're paying 100,000? It, it, it depends, it depends on the agent. Yeah, because then they they are then supposed to help you with the pr passport, if it's a visa required, all those documentation. So the argument, you know, is that uh, whatever amount of money we get, it's only a small percentage that we get because the rest goes into the documentation. All right. Yeah. Um, I would like to appreciate Minister of Foreign Affairs, just because they are a bit responsive. When you go to the ministry in person, they will receive you. They will listen to you, even if it's for a short while, and they will tell you the steps they are taking uh, to assist you, or rather, the family that is in need. Okay, But the challenge comes in because th there are just, just too many cases, and the officers over there sort of like take turns. So today, I'm handling your case, Jeff. If you come tomorrow, it is someone else. Mm -hmm. And with these cases, there's a kind of rapport that you also establish with the person who is trying to assist you because they have your history, uh, they understand, they appreciate, maybe sometimes you've confided some information. So when the families get a different person the following day or the, uh, the next time they're coming, it, it, it brings with it... Um, some kind of trust issues because they're not sure. Are you sure my case will be handled uh, the way it should be? Because the last time I came, it was A, dealing. This time I've come, uh, I've seen B. The following time, the, the next time you come, you find someone else. You've mentioned that uh, people pay an amount, let's say 100000 150 This is now for paperwork and, uh, you know, medical and all that. But is it really worth it? What amount do people leave this country to go and, uh, uh, and earn per month? Because uh, you see, before, before, before that, you have to also pay for tickets, carry yeah, a bit yeah. of an allowance. Yeah. So what happens is, and, and that's why I'm talking about desperation, because in Kenya, the minimum wage for households is supposed to be ranging between... 15 or 14,000. Yeah, 14, 15,000. But how many of us pay them that much? How many of us Kenyans pay our fellow Kenyans that much as a household? You see, mm. so someone rather go there and get, say, thirty to 40,000 per month as a household. Can you see the difference? It's like double. And sometimes those who go and find themselves as household did not go there with that intention. Sometimes they went there looking for, um, you know, being a teacher, an English teacher or some other kind of skilled work, but they find themselves ending up being house helps. And when they leave here, they'll sign contracts with these agencies to go as teachers, or how do they get there as teachers? First? Yeah, but there's, there's so, when you talk about the contract, there's something about this contract, because some of them don't even have these contracts when they get to their destination. Or the contracts they sign here is different from what they find there. And mind you, when you get there, the employer takes your documents and there's nothing much you can do and of course initially maybe they're nice and whatever then as time goes by you start realizing that this is not really what you wanted and then you start feeling like you want to go back home and then when you start raising questions or those concerns and that is where like Diana said when she got there she was told you will remain here I've bought you I can quote her she said I bought uh, I mean she quoted the words and said yeah I, I bought you, so you will stay here until the contract ends. But Zaina, that sounds like modern day slavery. Exactly. Exactly. If someone says they own you, they exactly. bought you. Exactly. They can do whatever they... And if you recall, she said, has is a tip of the iceberg. Despite us seeing it like a very serious case, 
she described it as a tip of the iceberg. And she described it meaning that, according to her, she was not even suffering as much as other colleagues are, are suffering over there. It is a failure by the state to protect its people mm. because they say uh, they've signed some bilateral agreements with some countries, for example, Saudi Arabia. But then, w w what is going on? And if someone or if one country breaches that bilateral agreement, can't we just cancel? Ca I mean, we have prioritized profits over our own lives. Now let but me ask you, you know, because most of the stories we hear is about Saudi Arabia. How, how is it like in the rest of the Middle East? It's worse in, for example, Iraq. It's worse. Are there Kenyans there? Yes. Doing the same thing? A, f a few of them. Like, there's one case I handled and that was offered. Okay. She died. Mm -hmm. And it took... I, even as I speak, I'm not sure she she was bar she's buried. I'm not sure, but by then it had been six months after her death, and her body was not yet in Kenya. Oh, yes, you know, so it's uh, it's it's worse in other countries. And yet, there's ninety seven thousand Kenyans in Saudi. Uh, yes, ninety seven thousand. Yes, I mean, come on, how much desperation can that be? You know, and are there any good news stories? I mean, uh, all we hear is horror stories. Are there good news stories? I know, I know of a good news story that uh, one family even was now processing for this lady to go back. There are, but those are very few cases, Jeff. I, I heard somewhere at some point that people, if you're going to Saudi Arabia, register with, let's say, Nick uh, Bureau of Employers, blah, blah, blah. Then when you go there, they can also check up on you and your welfare wherever you work. Is there something like that, that, that framework like that in place? There's, there's the Association of Skilled Migrant Agencies in Kenya, ASMAC. Mm -hmm. But have you heard of them? Have you heard them speaking against any of these atrocities? Have you had the National Employment Authority speaking against these uh, atrocities? Have you had any body because ASMAC is a professional body mm. i would expect for instance if because let me speak about lawyers because i'm a lawyer i would expect for instance the law society of kenya mm. to speak out against uh, i mean if something has gone viral about a certain lawyer i would i would expect that they would make a statement and say okay we regret that this and this has happened but we are in contact with so and so and we are trying you know, just even a, a simple press statement. Mm. Have you had anything from ASMAC? No. Or have you had anything from the National oh. Employment Authority? Never even heard of ASMAC. I know people go as drivers, bouncers. Mm. Mm. Uh, there's usually a whole list of uh, job opportunities. Are there others, you know? Yeah, there are others who are driving, um, especially men. I don't know why. Um, in, in other skilled uh, jobs. So there are others who, who are making a, a good amount of money and the working conditions are not as bad. And of course, we cannot speak for them too much because then, you see, and, unless someone complains or unless someone raises... And, and you know men like to work uh, stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah, So maybe they could be going through such, but, uh, but I'm telling you it's not as bad as what the house elves are going through. Being mistreated is not strictly Saudi Arabian, because I know even here in Kenya, a lot of women mistreat their house elves. How do we also take care of the situation back here at home? Because you see, if you're mistreated here for 7,000, you'd be like, I'd rather be treated this way for 40, mm -hmm. until you get there, and mm -hmm. then you realize the mistreatment there mm -hmm. by someone who is going through his own issues mm -hmm. all day, and you can't come back, is even worse. What are we doing about also the mistreatment that women go through here? And just like I started by saying, we have failed our own people. Because by us not complying with the laws, because I mean, if you don't pay your, your house help the amount of money that they're supposed to be paid, you're breaking the law, right? Mm -hmm. However, we've leveraged on their ignorance in terms of them going to court. Of course, it's costly, but we have a few 
mm. who've gone to court and we know the amount of money that their employers have been ordered to pay yes. up to about 3 million Kenya shillings, right? But the majority of people who end up doing these jobs are not people that even have the money to go to court in mm. case you abuse them. Yeah. So it, it's up to us as individuals and as a collective society to decide that you know what, let's let's treat our people better. Uh, let's treat our people better so that they don't have to go abroad to get jobs. What about Kenya's embassy abroad? For instance, in Saudi Arabia. That is another. That is another whole story altogether. I mean, some of you have contacted them, and on air we've had the kind of tone they use even when you try to reach out. Um, it's a sad state of affairs because there has to be some kind of change. That is the place that Kenyans run to when they feel, you know, they they need help, and that is the very same place that they're also that they also get rejected, mistreated, yeah. No. Well, well, I mean, when you go to that consulate and you're told to go back to your employer or contact your agent, knowing very well what we have, the kind of situation we have with the agents, then where, where do we, that's why I said, this is a man-eat-man -man scenario. Manifestation of man eat man scenario. If Jeff, you're in the consulate and you're a Kenyan, I expect you to understand me better than my employer or my agent who is not even there. Mm -hmm. We are here with you in the studio. If I need help, it's you to help me. But if you keep telling me to go back to my agent who is not picking my calls, who is abusing my family members, why do you expect me to go? So while we want these remittances, let's be aware that these people who are remitting are human. And if they're not well in terms of their health, Diana talked about how mentally uh, tortured the ladies are over there. We could see the other lady was, her name was what, Jerry? Mm. We, we could see, like, she was distraught. She was disoriented. Some, uh, she, uh, Diana said, some people don't even remember their own names. So how is this person supposed to work and remit whatever amount of money she's supposed to remit. But the humans are, you know, they're not being forced to go, uh, Zaina. Mm. That's the thing. They're not being, you know, forced to Jeff, go. They're being forced by circumstances, not you and I. Someone feels like, no, I, how do I put this? Like, instead of committing suicide here in Kenya because I have nothing to do, if I get someone to help me with this and that. And sometimes, sometimes, the agents also offer to help and say, okay, so from whatever I've sorted you, from your salary, we, we have an agreement that we'll be deducting this amount you get. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not like, sometimes you don't even have the money, but when someone offers that I can do this for you, I can process the passport, I can do this and that, and then from your salary you'll be deducting. And I'm hoping uh, the economic model that has been proposed will work so that people do not have to go abroad. But the procedures, the vetting, the, the regulations, I mean, are they even abiding to all these things? And there is a challenge because even those that are registered, there's something that happens media between them and the National Employment Authority. Because if it gets to a point where, you know, you can speak rudely to someone that you're supposed to assist, then you wonder. Following up with NEA, following up with Ministry of Labor, following up with uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, following up with the agent who sometimes is not responsive. Can you imagine how much they need to spend per week? And you're coming straight from the village. And you're coming straight from the village. And even if you come to any civil society organization, we, we will call out on the government, we'll call out to the agencies, but the duty to protect citizens, the buck stops with the government. Because dealing with the agencies without the government is difficult. What, 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 what would you like to talk, tell Kenyans, you know, because a lot of people are getting uh, are jobless or are in desperate situations. What, can, what, what would you advise our young girls and even the men who are leaving this country for these pseudo-opportunities? 
The advice I would give is let's try Kenya first. If you're in Bomet, please try Nairobi before you can go to Tanzania or any other country. If you are in Kilifi, please try Mombasa. If Mombasa fails, please try Nairobi. With the advent of devolution now, opportunities have come up at the county level. I am personally convincing as we speak, convincing one lady not to go to Saudi because she has skills in hairdressing. And I'm telling her, please try Nairobi. Don't travel. No, please don't. Of course, at that time, you don't want to traumatize them with all these stories we've talked about. But you, you're telling them in a good way that, please, um, that side, the, the grass is now yellow. It's no longer green. Please just stay here. You can make your money in Nairobi with hairdressing skills and pedicure skills. So we, let's try to promote our own. If you have people that you know that have other kinds of skills, and can you and you as an individual or as a collective i mean we as a society can empower them please let's try to do that let's pay our house helps that 14000 15000 so that and let's treat them well so that they don't have to go abroad we are now past elections we are trying to recover all of us are trying to recover mm -hmm. let's support our people let's empower our young people with skills and not just skills but skills and try to attach them somewhere jeff if you can afford two house helps please have them mm -hmm. if you can afford to take them to school please do because as you can see some of them are going out there just to raise school fees for a better future. And some of them is, are very difficult to convince. I know you're saying you're trying to convince this woman, this uh, hairdresser and pedicurist, not to go. Yes. But for some of them, they, they, you know, they say, oh, you, you're trying to deprive me of something. Let me go and see for myself. You know that, that? They normally say, uh -huh. mm. Well, but at least you'll say you've done your part. When it gets to that point, then you'll say you've done your part. But... I'm sure we can do more than what we are doing. Mm. Let's not just keep responding. Let's prevent where we can.